Life is full of choices, and isn't that a wonderful thing? You have the choice of whether you want to have pancakes for breakfast or waffles, you know? There's, there's a choice there. Or maybe, do you want to have a hot dog for dinner, or do you want to have a hamburger? And then for dessert, do you want to have some pie, or do you want to have some cake? Many wonderful choices in life, and GTFO is the same way. For example, in today's level, R7D2, you have the choice. Do you want to get pummeled to death by chargers? Or do you want to get pummeled to death by shadows? <laughs> Isn't it so lovely having choices you can make? Hello everyone, Professor Scaly here, and welcome to my R7D2 level guide. Just like always, we will be starting off with a recommended loadout, but there's a bit more to it this time than just simply telling you what tools to bring with you and explain why I recommend those specific tools. We also need to talk about the jobs or positions everybody on the team is going to have to take over, and just sort of what you'll be doing from start to finish. As about 95% of this level is basically you doing the same thing over and over again depending on what your job is. So before we talk about the tools and why I'm recommending those specific ones, let's talk about what everybody's duty is going to be. So player number one and player number two, you are going to be the defenders. Throughout this level, you're going to have to deal with an air alarm, not from the very beginning, but pretty early on. And this air alarm is going to be spawning in a lot of different type of enemies, depending on which routes you go down in this level. So you need to go to specific zones. We have nice little funnel corridor ways where you could defend, plop down your sentries and just deal with these enemies as they come to you and we don't actively have anything to shoot at, you go to the nearby boxes and lockers, you grab the resources from them, and resupply. And you just hold out in that one set location until your teammates get far enough into the level that you could get to the next zone where you ideally want to hold out at. And you basically just rinse and repeat this almost all the way to the end. Your job is not very complicated, but it's very important as if you go down and the enemies get past you, the other people are almost certain to die as they will not be in ideal situations or locations, I should say, to actually deal with these enemies. Player number three, you are basically going to be the resupplier or the support type player. You are going to be mostly helping out the two defenders and just have or helping them in dealing with the waves of enemies by shooting with them, but you're also going to be resupplying them here and there. Although you are not going to resupply them with the resources that are in the zone with them. Rather, you're going to go into the next zone and grab the resources from there and then bring those back and resupply them with those because this level is designed in a way where you basically alternate zones. You have a zone where you defend in, but the zone after is not really the best place to defend at due to how it's styled. But the zone afterwards is a very nice place to defend at. So instead of just only using the resources in the ideal defense locations, you want to go into the zones that are not ideal to defend in and grab them since there are going to be a large amount of resources in those zones and use those to resupply your other teammates. That way, if the fourth person is taking way too long and you have to hold out in that one location for a very, very long period, you don't have to worry about all the resources in that area getting completely depleted, which would then force you to fall back as you don't have the resources you need to deal with these enemies. So you'll be running back and forth quite a bit. There is a little bit more to your job though, as you will also be supporting the fourth person on the team. You're not going to be supporting them the entire time though, but rather just when they're in a very sticky situation or when they're dealing with a blood door, as there will be two blood doors along the main route they will have to deal with, and these blood doors will spawn in a lot of strikers, shooters, and hybrids. And while they can theoretically deal with it solo, I find it a lot faster and more efficient to just have a support person come up and help them with the blood door really quickly, and then once it's done, grab a nearby resource pack and go back to the defenders and assist them. And of course, if that fourth person does go down while they're stealthing through a side zone, it's your duty to sort of just clean up their mistake and get rid of any of the enemies they woke up, and then also go back and get that person back on their feet, that way they could continue doing whatever it was that they were doing. Overall, you have a... Pretty difficult job as there is a lot of stuff you have to keep an eye on, but as long as your team is being efficient and they're not dying left and right, it's not too terribly difficult to deal with it. And then finally, when it comes to the fourth person, you're basically the explorer of the group. You are the Lewis and Clark, I guess you could say. Your job is to go into the next zone, figure out whatever it is that you need to do to unlock the next northern security door, and then go to whatever zone to the west or to the east to do said thing. Do that very carefully as you will have to stealth through zones that have a lot of very dangerous powerful enemies, and then just keep opening up northern security door after security door. When you get to a blood door, call for the support person, that way they can help you out, and you just keep pushing up. And then when you get to the next zone where you ideally want to hold out at, let your teammates know that way when they have some breathing room, they can pack up their sentries and then quickly fall back to that zone and defend in an area that is completely rich of resources as none of them have been depleted yet. 
overall, again, not really a complicated job, but you need to be very confident in your solo plays as you are going to be going through zones with scout type enemies, shadows or chargers, tanks or birthers, as well as a bunch of other stuff. So you need to be confident in your solo capabilities because if you aren't able to deal with maybe two giants all by yourself, you are probably going to wake up room after room after room. And some of these zones, if you wake up the enemies in them, it's almost a guaranteed game over for your team. So you need to be very confident in being able to do this if you volunteer for this job. And now that you know what all four of the jobs are, I guess I should say three jobs are, let's talk about the tools you should bring in with you. So when it comes to the defenders, defender number one and two, you are gonna be bringing in a bio tracker and a sniper sentry. The reason for the bio tracker is because you will be defending in pitch black zones from time to time. So being able to tag these enemies, that way your teammates can more easily see them, will help out a lot. That and there is a chance, depending on what zone you have to go in this level, you might have to deal with shadow type enemies. That or you're going to have to deal with charger enemies, which dealing with either of these two in pitch black zones can be pretty difficult. That and your sentries won't shoot at shadow type enemies if they aren't tagged, so you're definitely going to want to bring a bio tracker with you. That way you can tag the enemies and make the sniper sentry more efficient. As for why we're bringing the sniper sentry, it's just because it's a high damage long range sentry, which will work beautifully for this level because of how it's designed. When it comes to the support or supply type person, you're going to bring either a sniper sentry with you or a burst sentry. You're going to be plopping yours down with the defenders, you're not really going to be holding on to it yourself. And the type of sentry is just up to you as a sniper sentry would help deal with some of the bigger, more powerful enemies. But a burst sentry can help deal with the weaker enemies that don't require quite as much damage to kill. That way, if you get a horde of maybe 20 strikers, they don't completely overwhelm you as two sniper sentries cannot really chunk through a bunch of strikers that easily. With Biotracker Symbiosis, it's not the worst thing in the world, but having a burst sentry definitely won't hurt either. And then finally, when it comes to the person who's going up ahead and exploring stuff, you've got multiple choices. You can either bring a Biotracker with you, a Mind Deployer with you, or a Seafoam Watcher, and there are pros and cons to every single one of them. Since you have to go in zones all by yourself, having a bio tracker that way you know where the enemies are located and you have a better idea of if you could go for a stealth kill or not, or where the scouts are in some of the zones, can help out tremendously especially if you have to go in the shadow zone as you won't be able to very easily see them as that zone is actually very well lit and seeing shadow enemies in a well lit zone is very very difficult to do but some people don't like to take a bio tracker because then they don't have a tool with any kill capabilities so some people like to bring a mind deployer that way when they have to go through the blood doors they could just place out a mine or two which will help out tremendously that and if they wake up some enemies in some of the side zones they could just simply shut a door behind them place a mine on it and there's a good chance that that mine will deal with most of the enemies and that person could actually pretty easily recover from that situation. And then finally, when it comes to that Seafoam Watcher, this is the tool that I actually personally prefer to bring with me because if I have to go into a zone and I have to hop on a terminal or something and there is a Shadow Giant literally right on top of it, it's super easy to just simply Seafoam that Shadow Giant and then kill it without having it wake up or anything else wake up and then do what I have to do. It makes it a lot safer and easier for you in those situations where there is an enemy or two in a location where you really just wish they weren't there. The only thing though is for this person, if you do bring a mind deployer or a seafoam watcher with you, I highly recommend you bring a thermal scope weapon. So either a PDW or a precision rifle, because if you have to go into that shadow zone and you don't have a bio tracker with you, seeing these shadow enemies will be extremely difficult. So having a thermoscope weapon, that way you can actually see their general location and have an easier time stealthing past them or maybe even killing them if you need to, will make things a lot easier for you. As for everybody else, you could bring pretty much whatever guns you want. There's a ton of ammunition in this level, so even if you're using low ammo guns like, I don't know, the choke mod or the sniper rifle, it's not all that bad. Just make sure you are comfortable with whatever gun you're using and you can land your shots, and you shouldn't have too difficult of a time. Dropping down into the level, you'll see that your main objective is, well, actually not what it tells you to do. <laughs> because the thing is, when it comes to this level, you're supposed to be sent down by the warden to complete an objective. However, Schaefer and Hendrickson hit the brakes early on the lift, which caused you to be dropped off in a location that was connected to the mainframe. And the warden realizes this and basically says, hey, you can't get to where you need to from your location, so just sit put while it recalculates and figures out what's going on. Meanwhile, though, Schaefer and Hendrickson are telling you that this is time for us to gain control, so we need to head to the mainframe with a memory stick and plug it in. That way they can get control of the mainframe and pretty much just get us in control down here. Have control over the lifts, have control over security doors and such, and just actually start the revolution we've been talking about for a while. So right at the get-go, they're going to tell you that you had to head to zone 209, where the memory stick will be located in an orange shadow box, and you're going to be starting off inside zone 208. 
In Set Zone 2A, there will never be any enemies, but there will be quite a few resources. So go throughout the zone and collect those and resupply as much as you can. And then when you have all that, you can head to the eastern side where you'll find the security door to Zone 209. Inside Zone 209, there are going to be multiple orange shuttle boxes throughout the room, and one of them is going to have the memory stick inside of it. However, inside this room, there are also going to be five Charger Scouts. So you can either try to stealth past them and get that memory stick and then get out quickly, you could try to stealth kill them if you have Seafoam or if you're just doing coordinate takedowns, or if you just simply can't be bothered and you realize that there's a ton of resources on this map, you could just go in and maybe have multiple people try to shoot Charger Scouts at the same time or just simply shoot and kill one of them, and then fall back out of them and go north slightly up the stairs and just plop down your sentries and maybe some Seafoam or whatever on the floor and defend here because all the enemies are going to have to go through sort of a narrow little funnel way in front of you to get to you, so you could just deal with them one by one, and then once everything is dead, you could just freely go in and look around for the memory stick. Once you have the memory stick though, they will let you know that the security door to zone 210 has now been unlocked, which is true as you're able to head over there and you can now do the full team scan that is tied to the door. Once you finish that full team scan, you can then open it up and head inside. Upon opening up this door though is when things are going to start getting hectic because this security door is the one that initiates that arrow arm that you're going to have to deal with for pretty much the entirety of the level. There is no way to properly shut off this error alarm, only a way to temporarily disable it. However, that is located all the way back in zone 218. So we need to make our way to zone 219 as that is where the mainframe control is, because once we plug that memory stick in, our extraction scan will appear and we can get out of this level. So we are going to be moving forward and inside zone 210 there are going to be a lot of resources as well as the little rectangular bridgeway where you can just hold out. Like I said, you're just going to plop down both of your sentries and the defenders are going to get ready to defend against the waves of strikers, shooters, giant strikers and giant shooters that will be going to be spawning in. And then the resupply or assistance person and the explorer are going to go up to the security door to zone 211 and deal with that as that is a blood door. That or if all four of you are really really fast to getting to it, you could also just all take care of it as a team as the enemies from behind will take a a while to actually catch up to you as they are spawning pretty much all the way back at spawn itself. So deal with the blood door. Once it's done, everybody can start doing their own individual jobs. You explore, you're going to be heading into zone 211. Inside of here, there are going to be a lot of resources and somewhere in the zone, there will be a terminal. This can either be sort of on the left side of the room, the right side, or the middle. So look around for it and once you find it, hop on it and you'll be able to see that the terminal is password locked and the password or the terminal that has a password to unlock it will be located either in zone 212 to the east or 213 to the west. Once you know which one it is, you could just go up to the respective security door. Both of them are just open security doors, no scan tied to it. So open it up and then you can head in. Although something you need to be aware of is that the enemies in these two zones are going to be different. The enemies inside zone 212 are going to be shadow type enemies, so shadow strikers, shadow giants, and shadow scouts. While 213 will have charger variants, so chargers, giant chargers, and charger scouts. So you are going to have to deal with something different depending on which zone you go into. The other thing though is, so will your defenders, because upon opening up these security doors, it will add more enemies to that error alarm. So if you go into the shadow zone, it's going to add in shadow strikers and shadow giants to the error alarm, while if you go to the charger zone, it will add in chargers and giant chargers to the error alarm. So what I like to do is, right before I open up the door, I call it out and let my teammates know, hey, I'm heading into the shadow zone, so be aware you're going to have to start dealing with shadow type enemies. Or hey, I'm going into charger zone, be prepared to deal with chargers. But you're just going to be going into these zones and looking for the terminal. As far as I'm aware, the terminals can spawn in different locations, so I don't really have a screenshot showing all of the locations, as I wasn't actually able to find one out there on the internet. I found some that had some of the locations, but none that seemed to have every single one of them. From what I've noticed though, it seems like the one in the shadow zone will always be somewhere in the first room, it doesn't appear to spawn in the side zones, while the one in the charger zone appears to always be in the room that it's in, in my screenshot here. It can spawn in different locations in this room, but I think it will always be in this room no matter what. So just make it to these two rooms, go through the enemies and just deal with them however you best see fit depending on your loadout. And once you get on the terminal, open up the logs, go through, figure out where the password is, and then make your way out to that zone and go to wherever the terminal is inside the main zone, put the password in, and this will unlock it. Once it's unlocked, you just put the command into it, and then that will unlock the security door to the north to zone 214. Once you get inside zone 214, you could then let your defenders know because zone 214 is the next ideal location to defend at. 
So once they have no enemies immediately in front of them, they just pack up the sentries and grab any nearby resources, run all the way north, try to get through zone 211 quickly, as if you shoot in here, there is a chance you'll wake up the enemies in the first room of either the two side zones that got opened up, which you definitely don't want to do if there are a scout or two inside of them. So make your way through that quickly, get into 214, and then you just set up your defenses there like you normally would, and then you go to the north and end to the security door to zone 215, as this is going to be the second blood door in the level. So the explorer and the assistance person are going to quickly deal with it. Once they've all been dealt with, you just simply go back to what your roles were just like before. Explorer, you're going to run into the zone. You're going to go to the northern end. And there you will see that there is a generator that you need to plug a power cell in in order to unlock the northern security door to zone 218. And these power cells are going to be in both zones. There are three power cells in total, and there will always be one in the western zone and one in the eastern zone. And it seems like that third power cell will just randomly be in one of the two. So one will have two and one will have one but I have never once heard or seen of an occasion where all three of them were in the same zone, so you could just go into either one you want to. But just like before, these two side zones will have some differences between them. If you go to the east inside zone 216, you can expect to see three tanks, hybrids, and giant strikers and giant shooters throughout the entire zone. If you go to the west inside zone 217, you can expect to see a queen birther, baby strikers, and hybrids. And of course, depending on which door you open, will change up what your teammates have to deal with when they're defending. If you go to the east into the tank zone, one and only one tank is going to be spawning in a little bit later that your defenders have to deal with. If you go to the west of the Queen Birther zone though, then one regular Birther is going to spawn in. I want to make that clear, that's only one. It's not like before where they're added to the wave and they'll keep periodically spawning, it's just a single instance of it. And it's completely up to you, so it really just depends on what you and your team want to deal with. Personally, I prefer to deal with the birther as the nice thing about the birther compared to the tank is it does not rush you down. So while you're dealing with all of these giants and strikers and hybrids and chargers or shadows coming after you, as long as you're just not sitting out in the open, you don't really need to worry about the birther too much as birthers don't really like to rush you down if there's a sentry nearby that would be pointing at them if they did that. So in a lot of my runs, that birther would just stay really, really far away and I could just let all the other enemies come to me and then I could just deal with the birther at a point where there's no wave actively at me, in which case my teammates just have a seafoam grenade or two or a seafoam trip mine and we just quickly rush her, seafoam her with it and then we just kill her before anything shows up. That, or if you really want to, you can actually wait until later where you temporarily deactivate the error alarm so that there's nothing else alive whatsoever and then you can just deal with that birther afterwards. Or if your team prefers, you could just simply do the tank. Be careful though, as that tank is going to rush you down. So if there's a bunch of other enemies arriving around at the same time the tank, it can be complicated a bit. The zone isn't the worst to fight the tank in, as even though it's a long rectangular rooms, there are different locations where you can sort of split up and get behind cover. So it's really up to you and your team which one you want to deal with. But again, this one instance is the only one you have to deal with until the very end of the level where you will get another one, two, or even three of them spawning in. So when you're making your way to extraction, I guess that's another thing you have to keep in mind. Do you want to deal with birthers on your way to extraction or do you want to have to deal with tanks? Again, I prefer birthers, but you and your team might prefer tanks. So just make sure everybody's on the same page and progress like you normally would. Once your explorer gets that power cell though, they're going to go back into the main zone. They're going to plug down to the generator and that will unlock the security door to zone 218. So they're going to go up to it, they're going to open up that security door, and then they're going to go throughout zone 218 and deal with all the regular strikers and shooters in here. Defenders, you are not going to push up quite yet, as you don't want to wake up all the enemies in 218 because then you'll get pincered, and you don't want to shoot inside 215, otherwise you might wake up a tank or even a queen birther, which will complicate your run quite a bit. So just sort of chill back there while the explorer quickly deals with all the regular strikers and shooters in 218. Once they're all dead, let your teammates know and they can start falling back to you. And you, as the explorer, this is up to you. You could do it right now or wait until they arrive. But you're gonna go to the northern end where you find the security door zone 219, as well as a terminal. When you hop on that terminal, there's a special command you could put in. Putting that command will cause the checkpoint scan tied to the security door to zone 219 to appear, and it will temporarily disable that error alarm for 140 seconds. So almost two and a half minutes. So again, you can either do this right away as your teammates are coming to you, or you could do it when they arrive. Because once you've disabled this, you need to get a move on really quickly. Once it's disabled, kill any enemy that is still left alive, and then quickly resupply. Fill up your sentries, fill up your C foam launcher, or mine deploy if you brought one of those with you. Make sure everybody's guns are looking good. Heal everybody up as much as you can with the resources in 218 and 215. And then make sure everybody's holding on to either a 4 use, 5 use, or maybe even a 6 use medipack. Because once you're done with this, you're going to do that checkpoint scan into zone 219, and your team is going to split up once again. 
three people on the team are going to immediately start running back towards spawn as fast as they can, while one person is going to go into zone 219. If you're really fast and efficient, the waves of enemies have not resumed yet, and you'll be able to actually make it about halfway, maybe even more of the way back before the alarm resumes. Some people like to shoot their way through back all the enemies since there are a lot of resources along the way, but personally, I find the easiest thing to do is just face tank it, run through all the enemies, and just book it through if it's strikers and shooters just don't care about them. Maybe if it's a giant striker or a hybrid in your way, you could shoot it with a shotgun or something as you're running up to it to stagger it. But just keep running, keep healing yourself up. Every time you take more than like 20% damage, heal with the med packs. And if your med pack is running low and you happen to be running past another one on the way back, grab that other med pack and just keep booking it until you get back to spawn. And then the one person who stayed behind, you are going to want to wait for as long as you possibly can. Or rather, I guess I should say, you're going to want to wait until that timer hits zero and the enemy starts spawning in again. Once you hear them spawn in, you inside zone 219 are going to be by that mainframe structure and you're going to plug the memory stick into it. The reason why I recommend you wait is because even though the extraction scan does not appear until you put the memory stick in, putting it in is going to cause some negative effects. Specifically, the entire level is going to have a blackout, so every single zone will be pitch black darkness, and it is going to spawn in a bunch of enemies. Strikers, shooters, giants, hybrids, as well as multiple snatchers, potentially. So you really don't want to plug this in for as long as you can, that way the other three people can make as much distance as they can to get back to the beginning of the level. But once you hear those waves of enemies spawn in because the two and a half minutes are up, plug that memory stick in, and as soon as you do, book it back yourself. Make it back to spawn, and like I said, chug down those med packs and keep on grabbing more. When you get to extraction, plop down your sentries, throw seafoam and mines everywhere if you have it, and just get ready to defend. This is a very slow extraction scan that will gain progress a bit faster the more people you have in it, but even with all four people, it will take a while to finish, and all of these enemies will ultimately catch up to you. It is going to be a fight for survival on that extraction scan, and there's a very good chance your run will come to an end right here now, as this is where many, many people die. But if you can manage to survive, or even if it's just by shooting all the enemies and actually killing them, or just running around circles like crazy and chugging down a med pack, as soon as you get that traction scan all the way up to 100%, you are done and you have beaten R7D2. And that's all there really is to it. R7D2 is a fairly short but intense ride that can drop you off to your doom at pretty much any moment. Overall, I found that this level was very enjoyable and it's a nice take on a run and gun style level that we haven't really seen before. Part of me wishes that there was a bit more to it, you know, maybe another choice later down where we'd have to go find a key card and we'd have to go into one or two different zones again, or heck, maybe even an optional objective towards the beginning that would have added something else to the level, but, you know, the lack of such thing doesn't really take away from how fun this level is in the first place. As always though, thank you for watching this video all the way to the very end. I do hope that it was able to provide you with some assistance in being this level. I know that this was a pretty different style for a level guide compared to a lot of the previous ones, but hey, a different style to a level requires a different style of approaching it. If you have any tips and tricks for this level that you want to share though, or any questions for me, or you just simply have something in general that you want to say, please do let me know down in the comments. Hit that like button if you enjoyed the video, subscribe to the channel if you want to see more from me, and if you want to join the community I'm building, there is a link to my Discord down in the description, as well as some other cool links. Among those links being will now take you to the official GTFL merch store, which I highly recommend you check out if you're a fellow GTFL enthusiast. Until next time, prepare yourselves as there's only one level left to cover, the final challenge of Rundown 7, and I'll see you all in the next video.